of the focus works. Uh, and I guess we need to find out if people can, can tell whether or not they're seeing us. But uh, Check it out! We are live from the YouTube Creator Space in Los Angeles for this week's episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me in studio, we've got uh, Dr. Thad Zabo, Scott Lewis, and Ian O'Neill, Dr. Ian O'Neill from Discovery Space. And we've also got a whole bunch of people on the internet joining us as well. This has got to be the biggest Weekly Space Hangout we've ever had. Um, we've got, <laughs> of course, Alan Boyle from NBC. Hey. We got David uh, Dickinson. Hey, oh, hey, hey. Now I'm getting my oh, echo. Because you have YouTube uh, open. I, uh, in YouTube. Check. It's working. I heard you like YouTube. I so we got YouTube. <laughs> 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 if you guys want to wait, I'm just going to watch some YouTube while we're doing this. <laughs> uh, we got Jason Major, Light in the Dark. How are you? We've got Dr. Matthew Francis. Hi, all. But is he wearing a suit? What? He's so yeah, we should have fancy. Up a bit more. I'm wearing a sport coat. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. It's cold here. We've got Nancy Atkinson. Hey, Nancy. Hey, everybody. And we've got uh, Dr. Nicole Gallucci. What's up? So many PhDs today. This is awesome. Piled right. iron deeper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, and I gotta find our, our and we got a million things to talk about. This is gonna be a, a very special episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, so very special. <laughs> special. So we're gonna be talking about the Virgin Galactic. Uh, oh, I'll bet it's switched the wrong one. There we go. There we are. Yeah, we're gonna be talking about the Virgin Galactic uh, upcoming launch, uh, the Hybrid Eclipse, very bright Venus, uh, the Gochi reentry. Supermassive black hole formation, the Lux Dark Matter non-detection, Earth density exoplanet, the sun activity is ramping up, quasars suck, and uh, from the field... Quasars don't suck! They, they suck. In some cases, apparently they do. Yeah. Ah. Um, and then Nancy, and then there was a bunch more too, So, and we may have some other stories that are going to happen as well. Do you think so. we have enough filler for this show? We might need to make something up as we go along. <laughs> it's going to be, it's, yeah. I got nothing. I'm just here to... Copy and paste links. <laughs> <laughs> and be snarky. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you want to jump in with any story, you absolutely can, Nicole. Sure. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, with Alan Boyle because we had a chance to see a live presentation from the CEO of Virgin Galactic on the latest plans for the launch. So, so Alan, where are we at with that? Yeah, this is the second hangout of the week So uh, with Fraser. So we had uh, George Whitesides, the CEO from Virgin Galactic, uh, at a Science Writers Conference, and uh, you can see that on YouTube. But the big news is what was announced this morning on the, the Today Show, is that uh, NBC is going to be broadcasting uh, Richard Branson's uh, flight into space, the founder of Virgin Galactic and, and his uh, two children, Holly and Sam, uh, and uh, right now that's projected to go up in August of 2014. Uh, now they don't necessarily hold to that schedule because they're in the middle of flight tests right now and there's another flight test of Spaceship Two that is supposed to be coming up in the next month. Uh, Richard said on the Today Show that, uh, that they expect to do the first test that goes into space above that 100 kilometer line uh, early next year. So there's a lot to look forward to and uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm with NBC because uh, I might have a little bit more access than the rest of you guys to what's going on. Well, did we hear during that hangout anyway that not everybody's going to have access and now <laughs> later, like, yeah, you have to be very money. special. You are very special. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the scoop. Um, it was an interesting blog post, uh, and I want to say it was last week um, uh, that that Richard Branson put up, saying that he wants or he he foresees uh, this Virgin Galactic uh, spaceship to becoming the next Concorde. You know uh, that maybe someday it'll be it'll be sending you know people to from uh, from London to Sydney in two and a half hours and I was just and I'm, I'm slow on math but when I figured that out, I was like wow 
that's fast, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond, uh, right, beyond uh, space tourism, that's what uh, people have talked about for suborbital space flight, is that it's a fast way of getting from one place to another. The drawback is that you really need to engineer the vehicle to be almost as good as it would be for an orbital uh, or orbital flight because you really need a heavy-duty thermal protection system and you need to have enough energy to really not only go up and come straight back down but to go someplace and so it will be very challenging it, it might have to be spaceship three uh, to, to do that sort of thing but that's what everyone is aiming for is not just to have little up and down jaunts but to actually go places yeah, that was one of the really interesting parts of this presentation for me was just this idea that that you know there's cargo, there's all kinds of you know we don't you don't need to land where you where you started that you can actually take off and land in other cities and so that's a really natural transition from the sort of the current idea of it just being for tourism for it to eventually be used for transportation. So yeah, yeah that was that sort of surprised me that that was their line of thinking, but now it's not that surprising. And, and then the issue is the price point. I mean, the Concorde couldn't make it because of the economic and the environmental concerns. Mm. So uh, what's the market going to be for that? Uh, I was going to say financially, Concorde might not be the best thing to compare it to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I apologize in advance. The the audio for the for our side is coming in a different feed, and so it's trying to switch to that computer, and so that's why the camera switching around is a, a little sloppy. Here. I, I just I just PM'd you guys about that. I'm like, are you guys doing that manually? Because otherwise, I people are looking at your icon. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> okay. yeah, oh yeah. Well, you're you're not what you're seeing. Right. I was making sure you were doing it for them. Yeah. I care about you guys. We care about you. I care about our viewers. And we care about you, yeah, Nicole. Peace hugs for everyone. No, I don't care about you guys. I care about the viewers. You guys think. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, so David, uh, you've got a bunch of stories, and so let's get to one which is about this uh, this hybrid eclipse that just happened. Yes, this past Sunday there was a hybrid eclipse, hybrid being that it was annular across a very brief part of the track, like about 15 seconds of the beginning of the, of the eclipse, and it was total, it was the only total solar eclipse for 2013, and it's the last one until 2015, there's going to be one in the Arctic, there's not a to total solar eclipse next year, they're all partials. So it, it was kind of cool, a lot of people over in Africa caught uh, totality very briefly, Michael Zeiler from Eclipse Maps was in Gabon, he caught it, um, and I've heard from him, everybody's kind of returning back on the internet now, slowly from their adventures and stuff. Uh, a lot of the East Coast caught it, I actually went on a little eclipse light expedition of my own, and I'll attempt to share my photo here that I shot in Space Coast without deleting the internet here to see if it works. Please don't delete the internet. We need yeah, it. I'll, we'll I want to add that uh, Astronomers Without Borders and several other organizations raised money to send eclipse glasses to Africa. So they had yeah. like 13,000 eclipse glasses sent to school children along the path of totality so they could actually go outside as a class and see the eclipse. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So thank I, you to everyone who donated. I, I journeyed over, if that building looks familiar, that is the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center. I, I uh, journeyed over to the Space Coast. I saw Atlantis unshrink wrapped for the first time, went over there the day prior, and managed to catch the partially eclipsed sun rising up over the Kennedy Space Center. That, that took me a little bit of planning to find the exact azimuth in position that the sun was going to rise from and to find a parking space out there where I could sit in the morning and catch that photo. But... It was kind of cool. I hadn't seen a partial solar eclipse for a few years now. I've never seen a total solar eclipse. I, I hope to rectify that here in the next few years, if not by 27, if not before 2017 at 2017. But it was kind of a cool eclipse, and it seemed like it was clear all up, up and down the East Coast because there was a lot of photos. I, I scrambled back to the hotel to upload that to Space Weather, and about three or four dozen people had already beaten me to it. So, uh, but uh, it's uh, it was kind of cool. It wasn't clear here. I got up and looked uh, out the window and solid clouds. I was going to say the fur the further north and east you went for this eclipse, the more uh, the the higher percentage of partiality that you got up toward Newfoundland. I wrote a post for Canada.com on this because up toward Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, it was nearly half eclipsed, but I didn't see any photos from those regions, so I think they got clouded out. I think right above north of Virginia or so. It seemed like that was uh, the clear versus cloudy line right there. There was a system that moved in, so yeah. it kind of covered yeah. the whole northeast. 
We actually had just clouds and uh, and it was kind of low to the horizon. I think it was. It, we had where, a where, minute... from 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 the middle of the city. I, I guess I we, lacked dedication to drive out to the country for it. We we had 20 minutes here from sunrise to the end of the eclipse, so we had a very narrow window. It was cool. We had just enough clouds to make it kind of photogenic there. So, but David, what I, what I really love about your shot is you usually get the illusion of oh, the sun or the moon looks really big on the horizon. In your shot, you get an idea of just how big the vehicle assembly building is. It's like, <laughs> that, that, wow. That, we're that, that, took, the that took me some planning, too, because I knew if I was way up by the vehicle assembly building, you'd have an itty-bitty sun in a giant building. So right. I, I kind of I did some calculations to how far away. And it was luckily I wasn't in jungle or in the middle of the ocean to get the <laughs> shot. It was actually somewhere where I could actually drive to outside of Titusville to get that shot. So it was kind of cool. In the middle of the or Indian River. Yeah. 50, 56 years from now, one exoligmos, one triple saros from now, you will get an eclipse that will have the same geometry again. So, well, there's, I mean, the big eclipse that we're all pretty excited about here in North America is the one that's going to be in 2017. Right, right. right. I mean, I think we're all going to get a chance to see that one. We might have to come get together again. Yeah, that's yeah, and that's it. Next time we're we getting go. together is 2017. 2017. <laughs> yeah. Who has the clearest skies on average for that date? I think that's what it, it comes down it, to. It's, it's in the middle of August, so I would say the, the, the earlier in the day is going to be clear. So if you're watching later in the day in the middle of the summer, it tends, that's when clouds and thunderstorms tend to pop up. Especially so I would, say, I, I, would, I would say the further west, the better, is just my guess right but now. But not, not now west you're talking. Do not go west of the Cascades, because you know what it's <laughs> like. In, in August west, is yeah. great. August is great west of the Cascades. <laughs> Come on um, down, or up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. What strikes my fancy now? Jason. Yes. I would like to talk about uh, new info on supermassive black hole formation. This is, this is some, uh, some really interesting stuff. So there's a paradox that kind of exists in, in, in cosmology regarding uh, supermassive black holes, especially uh, uh, really early supermassive black holes, uh, the distant, most ancient ones that have been found. Um, so a lot of the galaxies that have been spotted, uh, some of the most, you know, the, the, the farthest galaxies that have been identified, uh, have been seen to have supermassive black holes at their centers. And, you know, we see that in, in nearby galaxies as well. Um, but the the idea is 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 how are these how are these supermassive black holes forming? It takes time for you know a, a black hole to accrete all this mass um, to become quote unquote supermassive. And you know when I say that the uh, supermassive, I'm I'm you know I'm I'm talking about up to a billion times the mass of our sun. So these are these are are, are really really enormous black holes. But yet we're seeing them existing when the universe was 900 million years old, a billion years old, and it just doesn't make complete sense that through the accretion process alone, they had enough time to all get that big. Um, so researchers from Caltech have been using modeling programs uh, to kind of plug in a lot of you know really cool data and 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 you know a lot of uh, a lot of data points and modeling the the type of stars that may have existed early in the universe when the universe was less than a billion years old and they have these they have these uh, these really kind of exotic types of stars they're um, they're supermassive stars and they 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 burn hot they they die young and when they go they collapse and start spinning in such a fashion that they have little perturbations in, the, in, their, in their, their makeup and their, in their, how they spin. Um, and what happens is they'll actually break apart, it, uh, according to the models. Uh, they'll break apart and form not just one, but two black holes. So we have two black holes forming from one supermassive star, and then those black holes end up uh, you know, accreting matter of their own, and then they're spinning around each other. When they finally uh, come together, you know, now we have a, a doubly massive black hole that starts up the whole accretion process. So they're kind of like already on the way to becoming supermassive when they, when they uh, join together from the single star that they started from. So that's really interesting. It's the first time that, uh, that this theory has been proposed that, you know, we might be having more than one black hole coming from a single star. Um, and it 
kind of jives with what they're seeing. So now star. the next step is yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's that, a yeah. ball of gas with fusion. It's a star. <laughs> <laughs> so now the next step is to look for um, the gravitational waves that uh, have been predicted to come from such mergers and see if they're out there. And if that, you know, if 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 that's found, if those gravitational waves are found springing all around around the universe, then you know this may actually be a viable theory. So it's just it's one of those interesting things that exists as a model. Um, observations kind of go along with it. So we'll see what happens with it. Yeah, this really is cool back stuff. in the in the time of the epic of reionization, which is favorite thing for me because it's. Uh, the universe was mostly this background hydrogen, which was giving off a hydrogen signal in the radio, but it's all the way down to really low frequencies. It's really hard to detect. So the ways in which the formation and death of these stars affects that hydrogen uh, is built into these models of the epic of reionization. And again, we haven't discovered it yet. Uh, there are teams working really hard on it right now, including my, cl my, my former collaborators who are out in the desert of South Africa right now. Um, at, to, and uh, the, the uh, LOFAR experiment in the Netherlands as well. Um, so it, once they see the signal, they can match it to the models that make the most sense. It, advanced, advanced LIGO is going online, I think, next year. What's going to be more sense, they, they may be able to detect gravity waves from this, too. It just reminds us how how different the early universe was from you know what what we're you know what's around us right now. Um, I, th I mean things just kind of kind of worked a little bit differently. I mean they had these you know strange types of stars and um, you know uh, the the ionization and I mean just you know it wasn't like it is now. It's it was you know the heyday. And we've cool seen other stuff happen for for gamma ray bursts. Have they looked into modeling what the what kind of high energy explosion you would get from. A Double black hole merger, each with their own accretion disk. I mean, I'd imagine that, uh, that that could produce some really in, intense energy at um, somebody short. You definitely know about it. I mean, <laughs> uh, oh, that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I have decided that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> uh, we have a request to zoom in if possible on you guys. I don't know if that's going to be a big to do. No getting closer. Get scrunched in. together. Scrunched together, guys. Yeah. No, 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 no. The problem is you have lots of white space around you. Can you pull us in a little tighter? Jay is the Jay is the, Jay is the man. Oh, you have ha you have okay, cool. We have we, the cameraman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're just get we're just getting some work. <laughs> there we go. There oh. we go. Oh, I can see working? your shiny face is much right. better now. Okay, too much. <laughs> too much. <laughs> Zoom me a shot. Yo, the camera. Just, just lean into your screen. Just everybody just lean closer to the. Shake for your posse pose. Okay. Um, yeah, me too. Hold on. <laughs> are, you, are you done? Yeah. Nope. Hold no, on. Behave. Okay. Yeah, all right. All right. Uh, thanks, Jay. Jay should come over and say hi. Yeah. Come, come on, Jay. Jay. Come on, Jay. Yeah. So this uh, is makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know we do these uh, space explainer videos on Universe Today and our YouTube channel. And Jay Harmos is a buddy of mine for a long time, and he's the guy who's been collaborating with me. On. He provides the camera work, edits the scripts, and brings the snark. So that's my job. Yeah. VP of snark. And uh, so the two of us have been down in LA for the last uh, for the last week. We're on the fifth day now. And we're interviewing various astronomers um, in the in the LA area, including uh, these folks. And also, we've met with Mike Brown and uh, Andrea Gez and Dr. Mark Morris, Mark Morris, Emily Lactawala, Ned Wright, Emily Lactawala. Yeah. So we've we've a chance to interview a ton of people, more people today. And then all of chunks of these interviews are going to show up out of the uh, the YouTube feed in the next. Uh, Wait, Ned Wright, like Cosmo calculator, Ned Wright? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> no one wants to talk to us. Are you kidding? Uh, I'm just excited. Yeah, yeah. So no, it's been oh, it was a great conversation. And so hopefully we'll we'll get a chance to get all these these interviews out uh, to you whenever we process them. The files are gigantic. <laughs> we need to buy a new hard drive so that we can fit all of the video that we're producing. In fact, I don't know if we're recording on this one. Like, this will end up being a 30 gigs when we're done with it. So. Well, we got the YouTube version. Yeah, we got the YouTube version, which will be smaller. But yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so let's check. Howdy. I'm going to go back to my little home now. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
All right, Ian, we're gonna try. Uh, we're gonna try having this conversation right here, and you don't even have your notes in front of you. I know. I usually I don't wear pants when I'm on the yeah. on the hangout. I'm sitting down. Looking that is sure. rule number one for hangouts. Don't, any, don't wear pants. Don't don't wear pants. Notes, we so. can't see your pants anyway. Say, we have to it's wear fine. pants. Totally would work. Optional. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's optional. Yeah. We have a tighter yeah. zoom. Yeah, no, that's very good. That's strong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about. Uh, how quizzes might that suck? Yeah, so kind of extending from um, uh, Jason's uh, supermassive black holes and how they're formed, but going back to the beginning of time, I don't exactly know when. I'm no cosmologist, but if uh, I'll ask uh, I'll ask Nicole when when were quasars really popular? When were they in vogue? Um, Redshift five to, to sorry, oh wait, Nicole, right. sorry. No oh. answer because I was gonna say they started oh. being they Bring started being around like Redshift six, right? So that's one billion. Yeah, yeah, so Redshift 6 through Redshift 2 is when they would have reached their, their peak. So about a billion to two billion years after the Big Bang. Which is, oh. right, and right at the end of that star formation was also peaking. Right. Okay. Yeah, so basically, these these old-time black holes, they, they, they formed around the time of the first galaxies, and they accreted a lot of matter, because they were really big, they are really hungry. So they created these accretion disks of, like, um, blended up stars, gas, and, 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 and dust. And basically, it started producing this uh, um, highly radiative um, accretion disk. And so, even to this day, we can see the the light coming from the very start of our of our cosmos. So these are very cool. They're very interesting to look at. We know of tens of thousands of these uh, of these quasars. Um, we can still see the light going through going through the universe. Um, but recently, in fact, today, I think it was today, um, a news release came out um, about a very small, rare subset of these quasars. Uh, they're kind of weird because they kind of suck, which is weird because quasars, even though black holes do suck, we know this. Um, black holes don't suck. Do. They pull. <laughs> they don't suck. They pull. It's gravity. Hey, I, I'm a medium. I'm not a scientist. Yeah. So I can't wait. You are a scientist. I want to hear it. There's a giant <laughs> megalodon at the center just eating everything. I'm a retired right. scientist. Um, so, yeah, they suck. And um, But also with these, with these quasars, they generate a lot of radiation. So usually when astronomers look at these very distant objects, they can see matter being ejected away from these quasars at relativistic speeds, so around about 20% the speed of light. Um, but in recent surveys, these astronomers have noticed that some of these quasars, a very small number, only one in every 10,000 quasars surveyed, actually pull in more matter than they eject. And they're actually pulling in matter at relativistic speeds. So we're actually seeing this matter being pulled away from us, being pulled into the black hole at relativistic speeds. And we just don't understand why this is the case. We've got absolutely no clue. It doesn't fit with any models. So it's kind of an exciting field of uh, science because you've got physicists kind of scratching their heads wondering what the hell's going on. But also there could be a very mundane explanation for it because we're talking about a very, um, a very intense environment surrounding these supermassive black holes in the center of early galaxies. The matter could be swirling around almost like uh, in, a, in a plug hole fashion, but almost in reverse. So you're seeing this matter going away from you as it spins away and um, coming towards you when it's spinning towards you. And it looks like there's some sort of bias to the matter that's flying away from you, even though it's still ejecting the matter. So they don't really fully understand. They don't know whether it's an observational bias, but it does seem quite fishy that there's only a very small subset of these quasars that seem to be sucking in more matter than blowing them out. Yeah, when I was reading that, the, the PI on there, he gave an analogy. As there's this merry-go-round, and there's an ant at the very center walking out and so it's going to be continuing walking out from the center, but as it spins, there's going to be times when it's coming towards you, times when it's going away from you. And he said it, that might be what's going on. We just need to do some more observation. That was a great way for visualizing what, what one of the explanations might be. Our on brains are melded. It's, we're, we're like the one, one, yeah. one, one, one guy. <laughs> it's amazing. So it's kind of like how, how planets appear to move in the sky during procession when really they're still going on the same path. They just look like they're moving in different paths. Yeah, and because they, they measure the, the velocities of the, of the matter using Doppler shifts. So just you looking at the, um, uh, uh, the spectrum of the light being received from the quasar, they can work out how fast this matter is going. They can work out whether it's going away or towards you. Um, so that, yeah, that's, 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 basically, that's basically it. Um, but it would be cool if there are a new rare subset of weird, sucky, Quasars. I, I'm down for sucky quasars. Sucky the rest quasars. of them blow. <laughs> they need a new name. Suckars. Uh, 
Um, okay, so so you yes, people it, are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, bad, bad man. Just, nobody bad comes here for good solutions. Come on. Uh, so yesterday, eating breakfast, and on I think Fox News, they were talking about uh, uh -oh, the Chelyabinsk meteor, right, and uh -oh. the increased uh, potential risk of of asteroids. And I know Alan, you've been working yes. on that story, and Nancy has as well, right? So I'm gonna start yes. with, with with Alan. What? <laughs> sorry. Uh, sure, I'm yeah. I'm going to in for like two seconds and say, Jonathan Langdale, this will now answer your question. So thank you. There you go. Question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sure. So um, there were three studies that came out in the journals Nature and Science about the Chelyabinsk meteor, this big thing that kept us up all night, February 15th. And uh, it analyzed where that uh, asteroid came from, how big they think it was. They think it's 19 meters, a little bit bigger than than maybe they originally thought, and what sort of damage it did. Uh, some people got sunburn from the flash of this meteor from a height of something like 30 kilometers. Uh, but one of the things that they stuck in there is that uh, they look back not only at this Chelyabinsk meteor, but also at other meteors that people have found out about over the years going back to 1908 and the Tunguska uh, airburst. And they determined uh, that uh, these airbursts might be a little more uh, frequent than people had thought. That at one time they thought something like Tunguska or maybe even going down to Chelyabinsk uh, happened every century or so. But now they think that uh, they may happen perhaps seven times more frequently just based on, on the record. And that's a little bit strange because the telescopic surveys indicate that uh, there's a certain number of these smaller objects somewhere between 10 and 30 meters wide, for example. Uh, and, but uh, now they're thinking that there may be seven to 10 times more of these things uh, floating around in the near Earth space being potentially threatening uh, than, than was pr were previously thought. Uh, it, it's, it's an issue. Uh, it may uh, add a little bit more urgency to this idea of putting up telescopes that can find more of these smaller uh, objects. Uh, you know, Chelyabinsk uh, on the scale of catastrophes is not as high as as uh, some of these other catastrophe catastrophe uh, potentials for killer asteroids that are much bigger, but it is a concern, and uh, certainly it's it's kind of a wake up call. That's what the experts said. It, it's something to remind us that we better get on this if we want to avoid the fate of the dinosaurs one of these days when we see a really big object coming. And it's good to be prepared for these smaller objects as well. So that that was kind of the bottom line from these studies. Yeah, and they uh, they kind of uh, really thanked everybody in Russia for all their dash cams, security cameras, and the <laughs> right. YouTube videos because they've pr provided scientists with data points that they've just never had before. Uh, so the the Chelyabinsk event is is really one of the most uh, complete pictures of a an asteroid impact that we have. So. Uh, uh, you know, they were able to track the tra trajectory, um, estimate its energy, which um, we now know it's higher than originally thought, and, and can't kind of calculate the, the force of pressure that that wave built up. So uh, all of this has provided more accurate models for um, you know, people who study this and people who predict what, what could happen with uh, an asteroid impact. So uh, the great thing is that, you know, from this basically you know one data point we've got a really more accurate model of how these things could affect earth right uh, the uh, energy release was estimated at 500 kilotons but it doesn't do as much damage as a 500 kiloton atom bomb because a lot of that is dispersed high up uh, when the, when the thing breaks apart uh, another point that they came up with was the origin of this uh, asteroid that caused the meteor that they think it actually broke off from a bigger piece of a space rock and there may be more pieces from that space rock still uh, circulating up there so watch the skies yeah and also um, uh, Peter Jeniskins uh, released a video they actually found some security camera video that actually captured the big piece that fell into that lake in Russia and uh, we've got it on Universe today if, um, if you want to take a look at it. But it, it's kind of cool just to see it happen, and, you know, 
uh, amazing that they've got all those security cameras up there. I, I wonder, Nancy, is, if uh, Google Glass becomes more prevalent, if you're going to start seeing captures of meteors from those start coming in in a few years or so. Yeah, it's because definitely you faster to take video with that than to take my camera out of my purse. Right, you're not having definitely. to whip it out of your pocket and... It would, it would already yeah. be spooled up and running, and it would just be kind of a surreptitious capture. So okay, yeah. I see that near too. Well, no, because you have to stare at it. So there's nothing surreptitious yeah. about recording with Google Glass. Cool with your Google glasses on. Do I have them? No, because I live in a cave down here with no Wi-Fi or cell phone signal. <laughs> so it's kind of useless. My new office, I'll be, I'll wear it a lot more. Perfect. Uh, all right, Dr. Matthew Francis. I. Uh, how did we not detect dark matter? All right, well, uh, this is um, the latest of a number of experiments. This is called the, um, the Lux dark matter experiment, the large underground xenon LUX dark matter detector um, that's located in the old Homestake gold mine near Lead, Colorado. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Lead, South Dakota. Um, confusingly, it's a gold mine near lead, um, but it's uh, it's uh, nearly a mile underground to exclude as many cosmic ray particles as possible, um, which would confuse things. And it is a substantial volume of uh, super cold xenon liquid and gas together. It's called a two-phase detector. And the idea is when a dark matter particle comes along, moseys along. Um, presumably there are dark matter particles in this very room with you, but you would never know them because they don't really interact much. So uh, probably more around some of us than others. But uh, they, they, uh, they, they pass right through ordinary matter for the most part, but the idea is that if they do interact, then maybe occasionally they will hit uh, a nucleus of one of these xenon atoms and it will create a distinct signature that can be picked up. And so uh, Lux has been operating for about three months, three months worth of data, and they found nothing. But the nothing they found was interesting because they Lux is good for a fairly wide range of possible dark matter masses, including the range that was um, possible possible detections from other detectors like the the cryogenic dark matter search the CDMS detector in a mine in Minnesota um, and what they found was that they could pretty confidently exclude the possibility that CDMS had seen dark matter at that uh, in, in that earlier data now there are still possibilities that CDMS did see something if it was a really weird type of dark matter, but I think most people are, are, are skeptical of that idea. Um, many, however, we, we should also be careful about what Lux has not done. Some, some reports I was seeing were saying that Lux had ruled out all of the types of weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs, that type of dark matter, and it has not done that yet. WIMPs cover a wide range of possibilities. Um, however, once Lux has been operating longer and once it has been upgraded to be more sensitive, we should be able to put some really tight constraints over what type of dark matter could be out there. And WIMPs are only one of many types of dark matter. Um, we're we just are concentrating on WIMPs because we have a lot of theoretical models for them. Um, basically, all non-WIMPs uh, become more complicated to try to detect. So, and bullet um, cluster? Well, well, no, no, no. I'm, right? This is direct detection. Direct detection. Oh, I'm okay, talking, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no, we know dark matter exists. Um, we, there's, a, there's a huge number of things, but these are all... These are all indirect measurements. You know, the the rotation of galaxies, the the shape of galaxy clusters um, is a really big one. The 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 pattern of of light from the cosmic microwave background left over from when the universe became transparent. All of those things are really strong evidence for dark matter. But we'd like to see a dark matter particle. We'd like to actually know what it is and how it fits in with the other types of matter that we know about in the universe. And so far, we've drawn a blank. 
but the search is far from over. Matthew, has there been any talk about whether there are any implications from the Lux results for what they might find at the Large Hadron Collider when that gets back into service in 2015? Have they talked about that? Uh, that's probably, I think, the, the, if memory serves, and, and again, I, I am not a particle physicist, sure. so mm -hmm. somebody would have to probably chime in. But my understanding is that the Large Hadron Collider is going to be better for the higher mass WIMPs, um, the ones that are, you know, maybe a hundred times more massive than, than the range that they were looking at at CDMS. Gotcha. So if WIMPs are lower mass than that, and we're still not talking, you know, really low mass particles here. There's there's other models that are looking at, uh, you know, some some dark matter particles that are that are lighter than this, um, and it's all relative to. Um, we're still talking particles that are more massive than a proton, for example. But uh, LHC is sort of complementary in many ways to a lot of the direct detection um, experiments like LUX or CDMS or or uh, others that are out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I've got a, I've got a story assignment for you, Matthew. Which All is, right. which is when we were at. Uh, you ready? Okay. So we were at uh, interviewing uh, Ned Wright uh, two days ago, and one of his ideas that I thought would, he thought was pretty he thought was an interesting sort of out there idea was that they could be the uh, sort of the remnants of primordial black holes that had been evaporating. Okay, that's almost been ruled out. Almost? No. Okay. Yeah, dark, primordial black holes, the idea that there were these tiny black holes that were, that were produced when, you know, produced shortly after the Big Bang and are very tiny so they decay by Hawking radiation. Yeah, people have done a lot of work on that. Um, my friend Katie Mack did some research on that. Um, yeah, Nicole knows Katie. Um, but uh, uh, basically... They could be a component of dark matter, but they cannot be the bulk of dark matter. That's been pretty much straightened out. Um, All right, but but least, then don't work on that story. Well, this is different than <laughs> primordial black hole. This is this is worse from a science perspective because we're talking about well, you don't know what happens to matter once it's in a black hole. So if a black hole evaporates, what's left from that? And so, so it's it's kind of one of these. Well, there's no way of detecting it, so I'm not sure it actually falls under science. And you talked about Ned Wright possibly trolling people <laughs> with this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, well, it became this thing, this black hole. Now we don't have physics to talk about it. So what happens afterwards? <laughs> what does happen afterwards? How are we even going to discuss space this? Space ponies. Yeah. Space, space, ponies. Um, space ponies. Ultimate answer. All right. Well, I'm going to move on because. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just uh, like to mention for all the people that are from North and South Dakota, the mine is actually in Lead, South Dakota. Oh, is it pronounced Lead? Okay, <laughs> it's pronounced Lead. I'm from North okay. Dakota, so I, oh, have to, okay. <laughs> I know there are okay. are millions of us out there from North Dakota. So, uh, well, well I've even I've even visited that town, and I did not know it was pronounced Lead. That's very. Yeah, pronounced I, I am ashamed. They laughed at the tourists. Yeah, I gotta say, they were like, yeah, tourists. How close is that to tell you were wrong? Well, How close like, is that to Pierre? <laughs> <laughs> Send a hate mail to uh, to Doctor <laughs> Doctor Mr. Francis <laughs> yeah, on Twitter. Um, to right, so, uh, so Nancy, uh, you've been covering uh, the fact that the sun is starting to ramp up its activity, and we had a few interesting flares, especially some. It's a great sunspot group. Was it eight to AR eighteen ninety on the surface? Yeah. It's coming. Yep. Yeah. 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 So Nancy, what's going on? Well, it, you know, the sun is finally acting like it's in solar minimum. Uh, we've, you know, over the year we've had intermittent activity where we get, you know, maybe an X-class flare here and there. But this is kind of really the first extended period of time that we've had uh, activity. So, uh, yeah, there's this really huge sunspot sunspot group uh, just kind of turned towards yeah. Earth. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. AR, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway. Um, it uh, today it blasted out an X-class flare. Uh, I know, like there was a certain period, like just a, in a week's time, like from October 23rd to um, Halloween, there was like 28 different solar flares, and I think uh, that activity's ramped down just a little bit. But you know, there have been dozens of solar flares since uh, mid-October. So uh, 
you know, if you're a sunspot watcher, a sun uh, person who likes to see a little activity on the sun, which I know Ian O'Neill is, uh, it's uh, it's kind of exciting to see uh, some activity on the sun. So um, Solar Dynamics Observatory is busy. It's been uh, putting out images of uh, nice bright flashes, X-class flares. So it's kind of exciting, and uh, yeah, uh, and then of course the other exciting part is that we get some great uh, aurora astrophotos. So uh, we'll be looking for some more of those from our friends in uh, Norway and Canada and Iceland, that kind of thing. So hopefully we can post a few of those soon. And people are getting quite excited about this um, this uh, event around Halloween because it's the 10 year anniversary since the Halloween uh, solar storms um, in in 2003. And uh, back then was the last maximum of the solar cycle uh, of the previous cycle, and that produced a the record um, energetic flare. I think it was. It was like an X twenty odd flare. Oh, it was yeah. like yeah. Halloween flares, flares. Yeah. Halloween yeah. Flares. And yeah. Um, and this year there was kind of hopes that perhaps it could be another um, turbulent uh, Halloween, but it didn't happen. But there were there were some snort storms, as as Nancy said. There was uh, there was a few. A few decent sized flares, but certainly nothing compared to what happened ten years ago. That that image up there right now, Fraser, is from my backyard a few hours ago oh, from really? with the eight inch scope. So the white white light filter. So it's a pretty big sunspot group. Yeah, and that's the one, AR eighteen ninety. Yeah. Right? That's the thing. We still don't have a way of predicting flares, so that thing could pop off. We might get an event that's not. You just have to keep watching and. And I guess some people hoping, but probably people who are in charge of satellites or electrical grids, hoping for the opposite. Because <laughs> yeah. That could cause some huge problems. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, we were talking about this yesterday in our in our interview, right? Mm -hmm. That that our more advanced societies becomes more and more fragile to the so, the kinds of solar activity that we're starting to see. And if you think, I mean, just ten years ago during the uh, Halloween storm um, of 2003, we had. Um, Aircraft being diverted from polar flight paths because of communication blackouts. Because when the solar particles interact with our atmosphere, they cause um, all kinds of problems in the ionosphere where, where a lot of communications are bounced. So there was that problem. And also, I think a Japanese satellite was actually completely disabled by that storm. Um, and a whole fleet of NASA satellites had issues. Uh, just think 10 years later, where there's way more satellites in orbit. We are even more dependent on our gadgets. I mean, if you're going to say, imagine if your iPhone went out during one of these uh, one of these storms. Um, it, 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 these things can happen, and I think it's very relevant to our our technological society, even more so these days. So, I'll, I'll have I'll have to tell my wife she's flying today, so I have to say, hey, you got an extra dose because of the X-class flare. There is <laughs> there is that, yeah. And I'm like hashtag tech fail. Oh, send. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So funny. Uh, all right, well, let's move on. Uh, Scott, yes. you want to talk about frontier fields. Hey. Awesome sauce. So um, we, we've had the Hubble deep field and the ultra deep field and the extreme deep field. The Hubble's been able to go up and see as far back in time as around 435 million years after the Big Bang. And so what th we've decided to do with Hubble and, um, and, and Spitzer and Chandra is to use galactic clusters and gravitational lensing to be able to look further back than we've been able to see before. And it's actually already been done. We've um, had one galaxy that's been observed that's 420 million years after the Big Bang. So they're deciding to use a three-year time period of, of, um, of dedicated time on Hubble, on Spitzer, and Chandra to look at six galaxy, galaxy clusters to, to get a a deeper look and closer back towards the Big Bang than we've ever seen before. Uh, we just announced it with the Hubble Hangout on October... 24? 24th, yes. I was just sharing the link. I've been a lot of since then. <laughs> I think, I'm not sure. I shared the link on the event page. Yay! <laughs> but we, you know, it, we're going to be continuing on for the next three years uh, sharing the discoveries going on. We've seen one of the, the earliest um, supernovae from back then as well, you you know, going through a, the gravitational lensing, and if you guys can watch that that hangout, it's great because they are showing how you look at a bottom of a wine glass. It gives you an idea of what we're looking at. Not the light's not working the exact same way as that, but you're seeing the light come through and it's bending around and coming back. And one of the best parts of this is not only are we able to see further back, 
but we're able to understand how gravitational lensing works by directly observing through these gravitational lenses. So you're kind of getting a twofer with the science as far as seeing further back, but also having a better understanding of the gravitational lensing and this dark matter that makes it up. One of the interesting, one of the questions that I had during the, um, the uh, uh, hangout for that was, is all light bent the same way? Um, through this gravitational lensing, and the interesting answer was yes. It doesn't matter if it's it doesn't matter if it's infrared, ultraviolet, uh, near infrared, X-ray. It's all bent. Uh, it's all yes. affected the same way by the gravitational lensing. Um, so you know you can get all of that different science can can be gathered by this uh, you know by the various uh, telescopes and observatories and all of their instruments on board, which is great. Yeah, yeah the lenses are easier to see some yeah. wavelengths than others. Right. Well, it's achromatic, so it's going to be bending yeah. the light the same way. And since we're having Hubble, Chandra, and Spitzer there with the different wavelengths they're able to observe at, it's going to be fantastic. We're getting this, this great spectrum of light coming through. In using this, you know, something that it's very mysterious to us. Everyone freaks out, dark matter, what's this? You guys are just making stuff up. Well, now we're actually able to use it to see further back in time and, and, and closer and deeper into the cosmos, which I think is fantastic. It's really exciting. And then James Webb. Yay! <laughs> Yay. The flip side of it is because of using the lensing, you can get a distribution of the dark matter inside a galaxy cluster. So not only you can map things much closer back to the Big Bang than you could before, but you also get an understanding of these most massive gravitationally bound structures in the universe. So again, there's your two for... Yeah. So. Yay, twofer. <laughs> I, but yeah, we've got a dedicated site over there. If you go to frontierfields.wordpress.com, uh, we have it just set up for that, and also on hubblesite.org, we have everything set up for Frontier Fields. It's going to be three years. I want to say it's two million seconds of Hubble time is going to be used wow. for it, which is insane. And yeah, there's just so much we can learn, and everyone on the team's excited, especially the collaboration with the three great observatories. It's going to be wonderful. I think considering this like the um, Hubble's last big project, I mean... I don't, want to, I don't want to put her down. No, <laughs> I don't. No, it's, it's just a shame because you, there's almost this finality, this right. you know, excitement about this big, big final push. I'm just wondering if this is like the last big project she's really going to do. I, I don't want to speculate on that, but I don't, I don't think so. I think there's going to be more things that Hubble's still going to be able to do, yeah. but I think as far as looking back further... I mean, what else are you going to use to look, unless you're bouncing between gravitational lenses <laughs> to, like, <You> know. <laughs> the super space telescope that way. But I, I think that we'll still be able to use Hubble. But that's the thing. I mean, you know, unfortunately, Hubble will eventually come down. So how do you prioritize what you want to look at? And again, if you, you have this kind of resource, it's these space observatories are really the only things that can see this far back. So, all right, we've got this much time with Hubble. What do we what do we make want to make the most important things we go look for with it? And so yeah, this 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 is pretty awesome. We're getting a whole bunch of questions and one I wanted to bring up uh, from Michael Jobin. What's the focal length of a <laughs> a lensing galaxy? Can anyone make an estimate? Are we talking megaparsecs? Oh uh, hundreds of megaparsecs. Hundreds of megaparsecs? So yep. parsec is three point whatever light years. Right. <laughs> so Big numbers. Yeah, good, good question. <laughs> I mean, what is the focal length of a of the galaxy clusters we're looking at? You know, African or European? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's an interval <sighs> zero and infinity. Well, they, and... they tend to be a gigaparsec to um, several gigaparsecs away, and so this light is essentially, I mean, it's coming to a focus where we are from this distance from the gravitational lens. Um, but I mean, there's going to be multiple planes of the light. Coming. Yeah, it's not a simple. This is not a simple optics question at all. Okay, so. But I think re you could say back of the envelope gigaparsec. Forty two. Forty two. Forty two. Because so, I know I've seen a, I know I've seen a simple, a simple uh, kind of. Okay, theorist. Dumb thing. Stop. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> To make it easy to calculate, which is fine. Oh, cool. I mean, that question was too hard. Give us an easier one. Oh, we love oh. you, Michael. It's fine. Yeah, there, is, there is something on this. Um, with the sun, the um, the sun's gravitate the sun can gravitationally lend oh, light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The concept that perhaps it can be used for um, long distance communication between the stars, but the focal point of our sun is about three hundred AU, I think it is, or maybe even further. I forget what it is. But conceivably, if you put like a probe 
at the focal distance from, from, the, from the sun, you'd be able to uh, have it orbiting and perhaps communicating with other stars and perhaps other alien species. There was a paper paper going around about that. Yeah, I think it's about 550 AU. About uh, that's right. That there would be a there could be a, an alien kind of communications network that uses gravitational lensing points. Yeah, I saw that a few weeks ago. Mass effect is real. Yeah. Right. Oh. You know it. Yeah. Yes. So like that's like that's like almost out to the Oort cloud, right? I mean that's well, it's beyond yeah, the Kuiper belt. It's right? beyond the Kuiper yeah, belt. Yeah. yeah. So the Oort cloud is what right, to about one. One light year. One light year. Yeah, they they were they were suggesting we might be able to that, that that might be a place for SETI to listen to. It's kind of weird to think that there could be something in our solar system transmitting. That's just a theory that's out there. But yeah, it was kind of yeah, interesting. Using today's technology, I think you could detect it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, David. Yes. What is that really bright star that I keep seeing beside the moon every day? I, I, you know, I keep getting that on Twitter, and a lot of people keep asking me right around it's this It's aliens. Time. Yeah, aliens, definitely. It's aliens. No, it's, uh, Venus, is, Venus is reaching its greatest elongation from the sun for, the, for this evening apparition right now, and it is going toward its brightest right around the 1st of December. It's going to be negative 4.7, about as bright as the International Space Station when it comes over. Uh, Venus is actually bright enough around this time to cast a shadow if you're at a very dark location and you have something with very high contrast like snow cover and stuff. I've heard, heard people say it could actually cast a shadow. An interesting thing right now is Venus is also at its most southern declination since 1930 right now, too. So Venus is sitting down in Sagittarius, and it's very far south right now. You have to go all the way back to 1930 to find uh, a more southerly declination than what we see right now. But however, in eight years, it's going to be at the same point again. You have that eight-year Venetian cycle. Uh, Venus goes around 13 times for every eight orbits of the Earth, so uh, all the apparitions kind of r roughly repeat every eight years. So we're going to have the same setup come again in eight years. So, so Southern hem Hemisphere observers are, are getting an awesome yeah. with the... Yeah, they, they have... They have Venus almost straight overhead. Yeah, see, we have Venus way down in the weeds right now. So, But it's, it's kind of cool. It's the only planet in the evening sky. I'm doing a star party tonight, and Venus will probably be... Uh, it's, it went to past half phase, past uh, dichotomy, and it's uh, going toward crescent phase right now. So it's, it's going to be kind of interesting. Unfortunately, you don't see any detail. I always think it's ironic that the closest planet to us shows absolutely no detail through the telescope. It just looks like a blank white disk. I think that's kind of... That's a cosmic irony right there. <laughs> Uh, and then, Dr. Matthew Francis, uh, last week we actually did our big special on ISIN, so we didn't cover any other stories, but one of the big stories I know was this uh, Earth Dead to the Exoplanet news. That's right. It, it turns out that we, we, we've, we've detected a, a metric buttload of exoplanets. That's the technical number Not for it. Not just a buttload. Yeah, we all know it's that. a metric buttload, which is so slightly larger than an imperial buttload. Re rename my Dragon Con talk about this. <laughs> there we go. But the thing is, it, it, it turns out that the methods we have for detecting exoplanets are either good for finding the mass of the exoplanet or the size, the radius. Because, And, and Kepler, um, which has found more exoplanets than anything else, is good at finding sizes because it works by the method of transit. When the exoplanet passes between us and the star, it blocks just a little bit of the light. Well, we can estimate the size of the exoplanet from that. But finding the mass requires another bit of, of information. You need to be able to measure the gravitational effect of the planet back on the star. Well, as you can probably gather, that's going to work best if the exoplanet is big and or really close to its host star. So this happens to be the first time that we have found, let's see, I've got, got to remember which number it is. Yeah, Kepler-78b is the, is the name of the exoplanet. They're always so memorable. Um, but it is the first exoplanet that we have found where we have found the size and the mass and determine that it is in the same weight class as Earth, but more importantly, it has roughly the same density as Earth. So um, it is just a little bit more dense, but within the same, uh, within the error margin of error, it, it, it's compatible with Earth's density. Now, this is not Earth's size. It's, it's actually significantly bigger even so. Um, it's... 
it's about, oops, pardon me, I've got to look at my numbers again, it's about 20% larger in radius and about 70% larger in mass. So what, what would ha that would mean is it's about 20% 20, 20 greater gravity, if my estimation is correct. So um, I would top the scales at over 200 pounds on, on this planet. So I don't want to visit there anytime soon myself. But uh, actually, the main reason you don't want to visit there is because the only reason we are able to find the mass of this planet is because it's really close to its host star. It zips around the host star uh, in, in, what is it? It's ridiculous. Uh, it's, yeah, just a couple hours. Um, and so that's, uh, it, it, the surface temperature is hot enough to melt most kinds of rock. One story I saw said that this is a planet where the floor is always lava. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Tag your it. <laughs> what was that? Tag your it. That's lava. Yeah. That's yes. Lava. Sharks over there. Lava. So, <laughs> so calling it an Earth-like planet is is obviously not correct, but the fact that it is Earth density, this we're, we're basically working on a census of planets. We're figuring out what planets are out there and what they're like. And so being able to confirm, hey, this is a planet that is Earth size and roughly Earth size and roughly Earth mass and roughly Earth density, that gets us closer to saying, okay, what are all the types of planets out there? And it's also doomed because it's too close to its host star. What's the, uh, what's the um, spectral now, class now. of the host star? Is, what was that now? What's the? Do we know what the spectral class of the host star? Yeah, is? Yeah, it's a it's an M dwarf. And, okay. Yeah, so it's a very small red star. And so that would have more gravitational, even a small planet, like an, even seventy percent more than the mass of the Earth. If you have a much smaller star, you'll be able yeah. to get more of a pull. So, more yeah. for the benefit of finding it, still not a good place to visit. Well, now exactly. the trick is to figure out why it's even there. You know, I mean, how, yeah. how did the how mm -hmm. did this planet form? Where did it form, and how did it end up there? Because it's not going to be there very long. Well, I, I think it's I think it's probably a, another migration issue. You know, we think that most of the the planets that are that are really close into their star formed farther out and then migrated in by some process that we don't fully understand. And this, I think, is pretty clear. That must have happened here too. Um, it could not have formed that close. It's too hot. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, it's amazing just like how many planets they found so far. And yeah. just, I know. Have like, you seen the new orrery? Uh, uh, Daniel for put out put up the new uh, the third edition of the Kepler orrery, which is just you know it's just mesmerizing to watch. Of course, he uh, overlaid it with. Uh, um, Ride of the Valkyries, so that makes it even, you know, I, lo I love the smell of exoplanets in the morning. Um, <laughs> can, we, can we put a link to that on the event page? Do we have one? It's, a, oh, it's up on Universe Today. So Send it to me and I will. I, okay. I'm, my fingers are falling off from typing during this hangout. <laughs> now, I think I'm, we're out of the stories that I wanted to cover. Well, uh, David, just quickly, the Gochi? Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know if they pronounce it Gochi or G-O-C-E. -E, the uh, e, uh, European Gochi. Space Agency. Gochi. Gochi. I don't, I don't know if they pronounce it. Yeah, I never heard it actually pronounced. Gochi. But I, 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 typed it. I typed it a lot. Sounds like Gochis, you guys. So, <laughs> yeah. It stands for the Gravitational Field Steady State Ocean Circulation Explorer, and it was launched in 2009, and it is re-entering this weekend. It's uh, it's one of the more high-profile re-entries. Uh, this, uh, this satellite's been measuring the gravitational field and the, the geoid of the Earth, and it's actually uh, it's done some key observations of sea level change. It uh, actually was the first and only tel uh, space observatory that I've known of that uh, observed the uh, the earthquake and tsunami and that occurred in Japan in, in uh, March of 2011. It actually managed to detect the uh, the gravitational field disturbance from that, and it's re-entering uh, March 11 uh, March November 11th uh, around Monday, a day or so on either side of that. But it's a uh, it's it's a more high-profile re-entry. It actually. Orbits at a very low altitude, and it has an ion engine that it's been using uh, to keep altitude, kind of like uh, NASA's Dawn spacecraft. It's uh, and it's one of the very few satellites that looks kind of cool because it actually has uh, aerodynamic surfaces on it because it has to contend with that upper Earth atmosphere. 
That's another reason they had the ion engine again, so they could readjust it periodically. It was uh, supposed to last for two years, and it lasted for four, so they, they got a pretty good deal out of that spacecraft. Now, is it going to be uncontrolled entry? Is it going to? Uh, it's pretty much uncontrolled. Yeah, it's on a sun synchronous polar orbit, so it could really come down anywhere. It's uh, it, it covers pretty much the entire globe on its orbit. And, and, right, so. and how much and how much of it is supposed to survive reentry? Uh, I believe I believe it's about the satellite is about half a ton. Uh, it's much smaller than the UR's reentry. Remember that was another high profile reentry about a year and a half ago. That was about four or five tons, I believe it was. So uh, th th some of it may survive, but I don't think a, a lot of it. And there's nothing hazardous. There's, it's not like Phobos Grunt where there was hydrazine. There's no radioactive material or anything like that on there. So it, it may just put on a good light show if anybody sees it. So. Yeah, it, it, it's about a ton. And uh, they think okay. that 80% uh, that, uh, of it will burn up. So I guess that leaves about 400 pounds of stuff that, that will come yeah. down. And it's not going to be one big piece. So it doesn't seem like people are worried about it all that much, like you said. Yeah. It might be a good light show. Yeah. Over of course, it would be Pacific. about 600 pounds on Kepler 78B. Twenty percent. It's not that much bigger. Now, Paul, have you got any questions from from people? Yes. So we have been getting a bunch of questions. Uh, you guys have been answering each other's questions, which is very helpful. I've been trying to answer questions along the way, which is why I'm like overtyping this this time. Um, but there are a couple I can't answer because I'm not well enough informed on. Um, I don't know. This must have come up. At, I don't know if this came up at some point. We were talking about gravitational waves, and and uh, where is it? Um, there was a question asking if. Grav oh, yes, Hugo Berman. Would gravitational lenses bend to gravitational waves? Which was an yes. interesting question. It would. Okay, I didn't think they same would. amount as light. I know. I know. Gravity waves are supposed to move at the same speed as light, right? So then, yeah. right. How, what mechanism does it bend it by? Is it it's exactly. It's it's exactly the same principle. Everything moving at the speed of light would bend at the same. Would bend the same amount because okay. it has to do with the shape of paths okay. in in a gravi in, in in gravitational curvature. So. Okay. Also, space time awesome. being bent, so the wave travels through space time, so it just goes sense. to the bend. Yeah. Well, there you go. And then we were talking about easy. we were talking about good. We were talking about uh, Hawking radiation and and black holes. And and I'm still confused on the whole concept of Hawking radiation, whether or not we've ever even detected anything remotely. We have okay. not. I didn't think so. Um, but the question was, um, so it's losing mass by losing what? Can particles. You give me a brief overview. Part it's losing particles because some energy in the from the black hole turns into two particles. Not yeah, quite basically, right. it loses basically, mass because it loses yeah. energy as particles. Yeah. Okay, so it's losing a stream of particles slowly over time. That's kind of what I thought. Yeah. But wanted to check. Uh, so there's one more right, that I just saw. Brave, that was you really glossed that over there. You get these virtual yes. particles that are virtual appearing. Part, right. Yeah. Sorry, right. sorry, sorry. Right. In horizon. Matthew, of Matthew, go for it. <laughs> one of them going in, one of them going out, yeah. and, and by going when they go out, then. The conservation then of the they carried away some, some yeah. energy with it, and the black hole. Gets... That but this helpful. is a very this is a very slow process. This is right. not for for every black hole we have seen, the uh, the the amount of particles that would be produced would be really really tiny compared to the the X-ray emission we're seeing from from accretion disks. So nobody's expecting to see Hawking radiation, and the bigger the black hole, the less Hawking radiation. Right that you're expecting to see. So basically the the only way we're going to see Hawking radiation is if we find a really tiny black hole or figure out how to make one which at the LHC are unlikely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, which is which is basically basically there's no chance of that. Okay. So cuz I've always kind of like left that on the side as something we've never actually seen and that's why I haven't yeah. Okay. Um, they, we're talking. We're also talking about green. Uh, the lack of green stars on the YouTube <laughs> channel comments, but I think you guys have that covered in there. Uh, there's one other question I thought I saw that I couldn't answer. Um, uh, what about uh, if you see a meteor in the night sky? So this person is calling in from Norway. What? Uh, I did see a blue one. What does the color tell us? Can anyone answer that about the apparent color of meteors? Because they always look white to me. So Sometimes it's a green. Equal composition. Um, I don't remember exactly how it matches up, but you can kind of get a rough idea if you 
or were taking a chemistry class and you had different salt solutions and water, and you stick that in a flame and you watch what color the flame turns as you, you put that particular element that, uh, into the flame. Same thing here. You've got this thing compressing the air greatly so it heats up and whatever elements you're getting okay. with the electrons in the element, um, there's a predominant color. If I'm trying to remember, I think, forget if like like magnesium is green or you know there's basically there's there's a chart out there somewhere you can look up and say this element if you heat it up drastically it will glow this color. So yeah, yeah. It's made of. Google hey, is helpful on this. Uh, that uh, that uh, sodium is yellow, nickel is green, magnesium is blue white, uh, and the velocity also plays a role. Well, when, uh, when I was a kid, we used to. We should take uh, with a fireplace. We would get color inserts, right? And and so we would like let, you know, throw the different pages for the different colors, and we would get but sometimes very different colors of the flame. Not necessarily the colors on the insert, but you get because because they used to use heavy metals to make yeah. those colors. Did, back did you eat the paint too? And then, yeah, <laughs> and that and that has got to explain a lot. Um, Guys, try this. <laughs> you, guys, you guys gotta try this. It's nutty. Um, but it's, but you know what? Now they don't use uh, heavy metal in their in their inks anymore. All right. Well, I think we should wrap this up then. Uh, so before we do, though, I want to give everyone a chance to station identify so we can find out more information. So I'm going to move through the list here. First, the remote folks. Uh, Alan Boyle, where do we find out more? Okay, so that would be science.nbcnews.com. You can also try cosmiclog.com just to get my stuff. And uh, Twitter, it's at B0YLE. That's my Twitter handle. And uh, when will we be able to see your uh, live coverage? When will you go in with the Virgin Galactic folks to cover the mob? When is that going to happen? I'm saving my nickels already. So <laughs> well, we'll, they've we'll got to give you a journalist on that, free, on that first flight, and then who's the most important? Yeah, I got, I got to get trained. I, I don't know, uh, Frazier, you remember that during that... Uh, during our chat with uh, George Whitesides, he said that they might have standby seats for mm -hmm. us poor journalists if somebody gets sick and can't uh, can't uh, get on that flight. But you have yeah. to be trained first, and so I'm definitely looking into getting some more training. Sure, to cover to cover the training process yeah. for you know. Absolutely. Yeah, there you go. That's the ticket. <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, David Dickinson, where do we find out more? I am AstroGuys with a Z across all platforms. I've been active this week on Canada.com, Universe Today, and Listasaur, and I will be doing star party duty uh, right after this at Starkey Park in Pasco County. So if you're around Florida and Central Florida, come on out and say, hey, I saw you on the uh, Space Hangout today. That would be a that's first That's what I star did. Party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's where, that's where I met you that time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, Jason Major, where do we find out more? Well, I'm at lightsinthedark.com. I'm also on Twitter, very active there, at JP Major. I'm um, over on Facebook at Lights in the Dark and on Universe Today, of course, um, writing posts and things as I find them. Matthew Francis, where are we find more? Well, I, uh, my uh, headquarters is at bowlerhatscience.org. I also blog at galileospendulum.org. Um, you can find me at occasionally at Universe Today, Slate, um, Ars Technica, um, where else? I've run out of, uh, run a lot of places. Yeah. And on Twitter at Dr. M. R. Francis. Dr. Mister. Dr. Mister. Dr. Mister Francis. That's why we call him Dr. Mister. Yes. I don't think he likes it. I don't think he likes it when we do this. Uh, I regret my Twitter handle. That's why we do it. <laughs> Nancy Atkinson. I'm at Universe Today, uh, NASA Lunar Science Institute podcast. At Twitter, you can find me, Nancy underscore A. And I encourage everyone to go to the website, how many people are in space right now.com. It's a big number. It's nice. It's nine, right? Yes. That's awesome. Uh, Nicole Gulucci. Where do I find out more? Noisy Astronomer. I live at CosmoQuest. Wee! That's all I got. <laughs> I just noticed the space pony. I spent and I have a pony in the background. No, I've I've been I've been having a really good time answering questions uh, in the chat or in the comments with you guys. So yay, thank you. Uh, all right, and then I guess the people here in the room. In so Thad, where do we find out more? So I'm on Twitter as at AstroThad, and find a lot of my stuff on Google Plus. And the virtual star party. And the virtual, the virtual star, star parties, parties yeah. yeah. Been a little quiet recently, but yeah. We'll get you back. We'll, we'll get you'll get me back yeah. in here. Okay.
Ian. Yeah, I'm the space producer over at Discovery News. So if you go to discoverynews.com and look under space, you'll see all our stuff there. And Scott. Uh, yeah, everywhere. Let's see, uh, knowthecosmos.com. I'm working with the Hubble Space Telescope team, so hubblesite.org, uh, the Deep Astronomy YouTube channel, Virtual Star Party on Google Plus, on Twitter. I'm Bald Astronomer at, yeah, the Internet. You'll find me somewhere. <laughs> you can't miss it. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, you can find me at Universe Today. Um, and I want to, again, thank uh, YouTube folks here for letting us use their facility. Yeah. It's just wonderful, just terrific. We've been recording lots of great interviews. They've been just so generous with their time and their gear and their space. It's a really great resource. So if you have a, um, if you have a YouTube channel that has more than, I think, 10,000 subscribers, Check out their website, and you can apply for access to this space, and it's just been fantastic. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome here. Yeah, so thanks again to everyone. So thanks, everyone, for watching us. Uh, I think the next thing we're going to be doing is on Sunday, we'll be doing the, the virtual star party. I'll be back home on Vancouver Island, and and uh, we'll try and sort of get those telescopes happening. So thanks, everyone, for joining us for the, the biggest hangout ever. Ever. And, uh, and thanks to everyone watching us. We really appreciate your support, and we'll see you all next week. Yeah, Pamela wandered in, and I'm like, you're the only one not here. And then she ran away. <laughs> <laughs>